are these people? Jeff Black should be still in the chat if you are. He wrote a piece that pissed me off this week because he was right. All right. And what he said was, Substack is social media, not business. He wants to bite the hands that don't actually feed us. All right. We don't, we're, we always want to kind of tepidly talk about platforms. We don't want to upset the powers that be or the, um, you know, uh, the CEOs who actually engage with us and get them to block us or shadow ban us or turn on us. Bullshit. Captured social. I'm in danger. Captured social media platforms are anything but independent opportunities for income, is what he's saying. Is that everyone is a creator, but few are influencers. Awaken to the scheme that's been run upon us over and over. It's all played out. I guarantee it. And this is what really hurt. But he's right. Not one platform provides living wage income for creative and truly independent humans who don't serve an algorithmic master. The captured internet offers no free market legitimacy as it's filtered and controlled by surveillance, by a search engine results, monopolies, and unlimited AI fraud. Now, what he says is he's, he was triggered by a post that Substack had made trying to engage and convince people that they can, they too can be successful and earn money on Substack. Great success. Coming to a Substack newsletter near you. Now, what they do is on their website, they put up this calculator claiming that if you have 800 paying subscribers, paying just $7 a month after fees, you can make over $4,600 a month in income. Wow. Mm. What Jeff says is exactly how many Substack writers have 800 subscribers or more paying $7 a month or more as per your great writing is a va is valuable advertisement. Ain't nobody his, got time for that. His contention is that anyone claiming to make a living as an independent media personality on Substack, Rumble, Rockfin, YouTube, or any other ancillary social media platform is A, an owner of that platform, B, an already established influencer or journalist monetizing an already large audience, which we see a lot of. C, an yep. early adopter of the rigged game, maximizing platform algorithms, like, for example, Aiden Ross over at Kick.com, and now the Hawk Tua girl, they just gave her $5 million. You think they're not going to promote the shit out of her? Who? And then you've got the liars, people who are representing opportunity to earn income as independent media which don't exist in reality. Anyone who says you can make a living as a non-influencer with original content, prove me wrong. Shout out to Jeff on that one. Go follow him. Mm -hmm. Dashboard, full dash closure is his substack. Full dash closure. It's jeffthomasblack.substack.com. I'm here with Jeff. <laughs> we talked a little bit about Appalachia <laughs> earlier. A little bit about Appalachia earlier. Norfolk Southern Line into Asheville is going to be closed at least three months. This is where they three deliver months. steel. All right. From Tennessee into North Carolina. A lot of rail moves there. Assessment continues on the Asheville Old Fort. North Carolina segment damaged by Hurricane Helene. A lot of this, you know, Helene caused millions, millions and millions of dollars in damage. And this is just a couple of snippets from over at Freight Waves. It's a much longer article. The link will be in the description after the show. In the area hardest hit in late September, on the line between Salisbury, North Carolina, and Morristown, Tennessee, assessments have determined that approximately 21,500 feet of track have been washed out with more than another 50,000 feet damaged by scour and an additional 15,000 feet of fill failure in slides. Multiple bridges have also been damaged. No, of, which, a lot of, damage. of which we heard last week that, it, that they were saying five bridges had fallen into the water and needed to be rebuilt from scratch. 
I don't know how many were rail bridges. The segments between Morristown and Newport and between Salisbury and Old Fort have been reopened even though public roadways have remained unavailable in some areas. And I wanted to show you on a map just where that looks like and just how much rail line we're talking about. All right. Charlotte is here at the bottom. Salisbury is where the rail line starts there. Everything in green is currently mm. operational. Everything in yellow is being restored, but isn't going to be restored for three months. And everything in red is still out, and they're still trying to figure out just how bad it is. But they can't get any goods between Newport and Old Fort right now. It's, it's a gap. So they're going to have to either truck them there or get them there some other way, airlift, helicopter, something. This is part of the reason why you've got uh, Appalachia asking for more help still. All right? And that that's not over. That's still ongoing. So please help them. The remoteness and mountain topography, coupled with conditions following the storm and resulting flooding, have made it difficult to even assess damage in the areas around Asheville and over Black Mountain. It's mountainous territory. Now, I got another quick hit here that was in Off Guardian, another Indie Media Award honoree. I've never heard of Colin Todd Hunter. But he wrote this really long article detailing specifically just how bad, and we know how bad Monsa Bay Bayer Monsanto is. This goes into some of the history of Bayer Pharmaceuticals. It goes into the crossover of Monsanto and the acquisition of Monsanto and what Bayer is now doing with genetically modified stuff. I grabbed a few slides from this. He says that uh, this, this is again written by Colin Todd Hunter. Environmentalist and campaigner Rosemary Mason has been relentlessly exposing the insidious efforts of agrochemicals on human health and the environment through a decade-long series of incisive reports. Many of these reports have taken the form of scathing open letters directed at corporations, regulators, and officials in the UK and the EU. She almost sounds like a um, like a Ralph Nader over there, like like Ralph Nader mm. used to be, a public advocate. Regulators! They're not doing their job. Mason has never held back in her condemnation condemnations of the agrochemical giants. After Bayer's acquisition of Monsanto in 2018, her focus sharpened on Bayer, scrutinizing its troubling history and its actions, not least during one of humanity's darkest chapters, Nazi Germany. Bayer, yeah, they were around during Nazi Germany. Yes, they were. Bayer's complicity as part of IG Farben, a chemical and pharmaceutical conglomerate notorious for its involvement in war crimes, has been well documented. The company was formed in 1925 from a merger of six chemical firms, Agfa, BASF, Bayer, Chemische Fabrik, Gresham Electron, Hecht, and Weiler Termir. Sorry if I butchered any of that. More recently... Bayer has inherited a legacy of deception through its acquisition of Monsanto, of which the warmonger Hillary Clinton was a board member for many, many years. She may even still be. Both companies have been accused of concealing the health risks associated with glyphosate, glyphosate um, the active ingredient in Roundup, and the world's most used agricultural herbicide. Internal documents mm. reveal a concerted effort to downplay glyphosate's carcin carcinogenicity while ignoring substantial evidence indicating its dangers to human health. Yes, it's carcinogenic. It's, it's, it turns the friggin' frogs gay. No, it turns the friggin' frogs dead because it's cancerous. <laughs> uh -huh. in, her, in her numerous reports... Mason has shown how Bayer shaped regulatory, regulatory processes to secure product approvals because the FDA is captured by the, the pharmaceuticals. They also influence scientific studies because they fund them and regulatory decisions while suppressing contrary evidence. Nah, they would never do that for profit. 
The environmental devastation wrought by Bayer's pesticides, pesticides is alarming. Mason cites significant declines in biodiversity and poisoned ecosystems as a direct consequence of their widespread use. But Bayer was not merely an observer, but an active participant in heinous medical experiments conducted on concentration camp inmates. Yep. We're sorry. Are they? <laughs> These experiments involve testing drugs on unwilling subjects, including those at Auschwitz, where prisoners were deliberately okay. infected with yeah. diseases to evaluate Bayer's pharmaceuticals. Allegedly, right? Allegedly. Allegedly. During World War I, Bayer was involved in the development of chemical weapons, including chlorine and mustard gas. As part of IG Farben, Bayer later contributed to the creation of nerve, nerve agents like Taboon, Sarin Gas, and Soman. Post war, Ooh, Bayer. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Post war, Bayer transitioned these chemical developments into pesticides such as parat Parathion, which are neurotoxic. Ah, nothing to see here. Mm. Here's the worst one. In addition, IG Farben was implicated in the production of Zyklon B which was the gas used in the concentration camps. They created the yep. gas for the gas chambers. Executives, it was just simple rat poison, Indy. God. Executives from IG yeah. Farben were convicted for their roles in war crimes at Nuremberg. Yep. Now, there's a lot more there, and I, I grabbed this also in saying that, moreover, rising cancer rates in communities exposed to Bayer's products cannot be ignored especially increasing cases of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma linked to glio glyphosate use glyphosate. in areas mm. heavily treated with these chemicals. Yep. Rosemary Mason is not alone in her condemnation of Bayer. For instance, journalist Carrie Gilliam has written extensively about Bayer Monsanto's practices, particularly in relation to glyphosate and its health impacts in the, in the book Whitewash, the story of a weed killer, cancer, and the corruption of science. Again, a lot more there, including that paragraph, but we move on. Be careful what you wish for. This is how I wanted to close this out for a minute. Why would a government want to do a deal with the devil? Well, that's precisely what the government of India seems to have done when it signed a memorandum of understanding with Bayer in September of 2023. Bayer signed the MOU with the Indian Council for Agricultural Research, which is ICAR, which is responsible for coordinating agricultural education and research in India. Yep. In July of this year, hundreds of scientists, farmer leaders, farmers, and ordinary citizens signed a letter and sent it to Himanshu Patak, Director General of the ICAR, stating that it's poison and fuck these guys and don't let them do this. But they already did. I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. I got one more quick hit. University of Michigan moves to eliminate due process for students. Now, I've read a couple of... Ryan McCarty, who guest posts over at Left Voice, we reported on University of Michigan in April or March about some of the stuff that they were mm -hmm. doing. And remember how they cut... Um, the graduate students went on strike... And they cut the health care yeah. for the Michigan students, uh, grad students. Yep. Well, Basically. now what they're the latest shit that they're pulling is that they are changing the rules of disciplinary hearings so that the students can't go in front of their own panel, but one that is handpicked by the university and loyal to them. This latest in a series of police and administrative attacks on university student and worker voices comes as a response to growing labor and social justice movements on campus. This is out of Left Voice, another Indie Media Award honoree. All right. It starts that in March, the university pushed their repression of community voices further in, the, in their draft policy against disruption, which was widely criticized by students, faculty, and alumni as well as the GEO, um, 
the lecturer employee organization, that the, the G is the grad student um, employee organization, all right, the which right. represents non tenure track uh, faculty, the AAUP chapter representing some tenure track facility faculty, the ACLU of Michigan, among others, a whole group of, despite the widespread criticism, the university doubled down on the legitimacy of their statement while indicating that they would continue thinking about how this new policy would be implemented. But an important line was buried in the university's response to critics, signaling their next avenue of repression of dissenting voices. Quote, we will also consider whether a revision to our long-standing policies and standards of conduct will meet our current needs. Well, that revision happened over the summer. The university snuck these revisions in this summer while students and faculty were largely absent from campus. How convenient. Mm. On July 18th, University of Michigan's elected Board of Regents, which consisted of six Democrats and two Republicans, all fascist corporate loyal entities, yep. sidestepped the normal process of consultations with central student government and the Faculty Senate, and voted to adopt a new set of revisions to the university's Statement of Student Rights and Responsibilities, which is the document that outlines disciplinary policies for students. I it, am the Senate. Well, and they, they altered the deal, pray they don't alter it further, because they did it without anybody yep. consulting. In mm -hmm. its revisions to the statement, University of Michigan eliminated guarantees that an accused student could ask for an appeals panel consisting of students, faculty, and staff. Why would they want that? Now, the vice president for student affairs, which is a university administrator, handles all appeals. Hmm. If the university were a neutral party <laughs> in these hearings, this change might be less problematic. But another significant change to the statement is that now... University of Michigan itself can file complaints against students, while previously complaints had to be filed by other students, faculty, or staff. With this addition, the university now gives itself the ability to forego due process if it so chooses because acting as the final arbitrator in the appeals process, this change gives, gives the university veto power if an accused student opts for a panel of their peers. This veto mm -hmm. would then force the student's case into the hands of a resolution officer appointed by the university, making it both the complainant and the final judge. Yeah, that seems legit. Essentially, the university has changed its policies so that it can prosecute and punish students freely without oversight from faculty or student representative bodies. Fucked up. It's important to recognize what University of Michigan and the state government's two-pronged attack on freedom of speech in campus illustrates about the connections between personal freedoms, working class power, and an anti-war activism. All three are being attacked simultaneously, all in the name of encouraging safety or avoiding disruption. This is the gaslight. Right away. That's what they want to do. And quick hits like that and art bringing articles and stories like that are why we get demonetized and we don't get the love from the algorithm and why they don't yeah. get, why we don't get the shares and the visibility that, that we need and why we rely on you for funding, um, for support, for Don't sharing. That would be nice. So we've got cash app, cash.app slash dollar sign Indian news network co-fee.com slash Indie News Network. Very important, that one. That's the QR code above Reef as well. PayPal.me slash Indie News Network. Rumble.com slash C slash Indie News Network. Or you can also go and sign up in our newsletter and contribute there at innnewsletter.com. There are all the channels which you can find all of at Indie News dot network. I-N-D-I-E News dot network. Mm.